Hello and welcome back. This is Fabulous with the Tutorial Ireland campaign. This is episode two. We have not unpaused yet, so if you were waiting for that, you might want to wait till the next episode because this should be the last episode before we unpause. I know it's a lot of talking, but you'll have to bear with me. So, if you look, you know, we've covered everything on the top row. We will kind of tie into it with um, these, but the first one is our realm, which also is the same button that happens when you click the domain. Um, if you look here, this is our crown authority. This is one of the first things you should also do in the beginning of the game. Uh, current law basically means that we are ruler in name, and that's about it. That's all it means. That you know, they can kind of do whatever they want. Now, if we pass the second crown authority, you'll notice it takes 130 day prestige, which we do have 600, so that's not a problem. So we are going to pass it. Now, you may ask yourself. Why is it important to have high crown authority? Well, basically that means that the higher your crown authority, the more restricted your vassals are in what you allow them to do. Now, bear in mind that this is going to piss your vassals off if you have high crown authority. They're not going to like it. They don't like being told that they can't fight each other and things like that. Level 2 allows you to revoke titles and vassals from people. And the government vassals will provide at least 5% of their levies and 2% of their income. So we're going to do that right now. Pass law. Done. We cannot pass another law until, if you look, it says we require royal prerogative innovation, the Irish culture. And we also just recently increased crown authority, so we can't do it until 1086. 20 years. So, trust me when I say this, it's very important that you start this as soon as possible. Because if you look at level 3, vassals cannot wage war against other vassals unless they use a hook on us. It is very important that we prevent our vassals from beating the snot out of each other. Because the more they're fighting each other, the less you're going to have available to fight other people. And if you make one vassal slightly stronger than the other, or one decides to gang up on the other through marriage with another vassal, you have basically a tipping scale where your vassals will, you know, just glob. And then you have a hot mess trying to break it up again. So, just be aware that if you're vast, you need to pay attention to your vassals. You shouldn't just speed five if you're not doing anything. You need to pay attention. If you notice that your vassals' armies are all raised and they're beating the snot out of each other, figure out who is fighting. Right-click them, and if you look, you know... Normally, I believe around vassalage and court, there would be like, uh, you know, stop vassal war right here. That is very important. Now, they can say no, but they could say yes. Now, if they say no, you can also try to seize, like, as soon as, you know, like, let's say Mr. Orman seized Ossery, which we don't own, but let's say we did. He seized it from somebody else, and we told him to stop the war, and he didn't. So we immediately... Re revoke it from him but he gets pissed and he rises up every disloyal vassal that can rise up will rise up when you do that but the benefit is once you've done that everyone who's disloyal if you win you can imprison them and revoke their titles you can give it to vassals who are loyal to you so you need to be careful because if you do it incorrectly, you can screw up your entire kingdom because if they win, they depose you and the next in succession takes over. So they can screw up a lot very quickly. So, all right. So from there, if you look, it shows you your holdings again, your vassals that you actually possess. He's a powerful vassal, so he expects a seat on our council, which we will get to. And then the succession. Here it shows you what he's getting because he's the only child. If for whatever reason we had another son, our main son would probably get Thormund, and then our second son would get Innes. But, you know, if we owned a lot of land and you had a lot of children, you can screw yourself up hard. So, it's best if you have more than one son or a really bad son, try to get him to be a monk. You know, that's a thing you can do. 
you know, like, let's say he's grown up, he has high, you know, education, whatever, blah, blah, blah. You had asked to take vows, use a hook, and then you might have a chance that one of your children will, you know, get out of there. So, the other thing you need to look at is your realm succession law. Confederate partition, basically, you know, your titles would be divided equally amongst your children. New titles may be created for younger realm heirs. So that is something that you can change, but it requires laws. The Irish needs hereditary rule innovation. You know, high partition, the lion's share of titles will go to your player heir. The, less, well, the rest will be divided amongst your children. Single realm, you know, single heir. You know, these are ones that you definitely want, but you need, you know, you see on each one, you need a different innovation. Now you might be asking yourself, what the heck is all this? That is here. This is your culture. The head of Irish culture right now is us because we have two, I think three provinces of Irish culture. Whoever has the most provinces with Irish culture will be the cultural head of Ireland. So, if you remember our crown authority, we need the royal prerogative, so we're going to focus that first. And it looks like that's going to take about 65 years. It might be quicker. You know, if we get a wife that has really high learning, that's the one thing that I think learning has an advantage over anyone else is that you can knock through those real quick. But the thing is, if you're not the lead of your culture group, then you have no control over this. And some starts, as you can see, the culture groups are kind of big. So not exactly something you can rely upon. Okay, but we are going to switch to Royal Prerogative. We want that as soon as possible. Okay. Also, if you have Absolute Crown Authority, you can designate your heir, which, you know, we're not there. Okay, so we did go over military already. Basically, the only thing I didn't cover was the Mercenaries tab, which we cannot afford. But Mercenaries are pretty decent. You know, there's some Light Footmen in here. There's some Bowmen. They're very expensive, but in a pinch, you know, you're not... When you hire mercenaries, it's because you're desperate, basically. So, that's when you do that. Holy Orders. Basically, I believe if you have a city that you control, I believe you relinquish control to them. I think there's a pop-up or a decision. I've only done it once, and it's only really useful if you're fighting other religions. The problem with insular Christianity is they don't view Christians as bad. And that's who we're surrounded by, so not really helpful. At least in this game. Other games, maybe so. If you're, you know, religion-wise. Uh, there we go. R is for religion, if you didn't know. You know, if you're way down here, or on this edge right here, they would be very useful. E is what brings you back to the main screen. R is for religion. T is for culture. Those are very similar to the buttons that your robot has, so... If you don't know them. I believe... Oh yeah, so you can click down here to change that too. Oh, that's cool. I've never actually clicked that one. Oh wow, so you can see that, you know, the different houses there are. Hmm. I believe... His house is from the beginning of the game. Oh, wow. Okay, so that's cool, though. And what is this? Oh, government's development, terrain, countries. Okay, yeah, so we're not getting that far into it. Because otherwise we'll be here for 20 years. Okay, so, we've gone over military. The next thing is our council. Now, the difficult part of the council is the fact that if you have a lot of strong vassals, they want a spot on the council, even if they are absolutely dog shit at fucking everything. Like, you know, our vassal here, Earl Ragvald, is okay as a steward, but that's it. If we had three other vassals who were better stewards than him, we'd have to stick him somewhere or, you know, try to... It's, there's a lot of finagling. 
vassals who are under the age of adulthood are not on the vast on the council. Thank the light, because if they were, oh, I can only imagine. But you know, you even look and hover over them, and they tell you your relation to them. Our marshal, our spy master, he's our only real vassal right now. We will be adding more, so that's something to keep in mind. You can also hit this button, and it'll show you everyone in your realm. You know, the highest skill is normally what you want to go for. But you can kind of see what everyone else has. Like this guy has 18 learning, which is really good. <clears throat> so, you know, that's a decent option. Okay. But for the most part, each one of these has three different tasks that are available to them. Collect taxes, you know, increase development, which basically increases, you know, the levies as well as the... Um, the money that you get if you click on Thelmond you know you see that we've got like our holding as well as our castle our church forgive me and it shows you what each one of them supplies and then development you have to go over development we're only at six out of a hundred so we have room for improvement Now, the thing that sucks is the fact that this is in the wetlands, which basically makes it very difficult to increase, but it also makes it a little more defensible. So, you know, pros and cons. Something to keep in mind. Um, you also can also change culture if the culture in the area that you're wanting is a different culture than your own. Which we don't have one available to us, so that's why it's grayed out. You know, your chancellor can increase, you know, the opinion of everyone away from you, you know, not in your realm. Also give you prestige. Or he can, you know, increase the opinions of your vassals. Once you get a lot of new vassals, not a bad idea to switch to allow, you know, your, your uh, king or queen time to really develop a relationship with them so they don't get too pissy. Um... But the last portion is Integrate Titles, which is normally only available once you, you know, like, gobble up land or gain a title. Like the duchy over here, duchy over here. You know, that's not normally part of Ireland or considered part of your title. You can actually integrate them into your realm to where it's part of your realm. The only problem with that is people don't tend to like that, and the people that live there are not going to like it and try to fight it. So, just know that. They don't like being gobbled up. Okay. So, this is your marshal. The marshal has three different options. He can increase control in a county that you own. If the control is not at 100%, which if you look here, the control is all at 100%, so we don't need to worry about it yet. You know, he can increase the control. Some of the times it takes a few months, sometimes it takes a few years. Really depends on his skill, which he's a decent, you know, marshal skill, so it's not going to take too long. He can also, you know, train commanders. Which gives you a chance of getting more knights. Since we have so many knights and now few to spare, it's not something you need to worry about. But if you want to be cheap, or you know you're not going to be fighting for a while, it's not a bad way to get a decent, you know, honey pot of knights. But normally you want to keep them on organized levies if you know you're about to go to war, because that increases the levies that you have. It also increases their reinforcement rate and the garrison in your castles and stuff like that, which basically makes it longer to siege down your castles and or cities. So, you know, something to keep in mind with that. You kind of have to play a little bit with them when you need to. And the last thing in your council is your spy master. Your spy master can disrupt schemes, which basically means that he is protecting you and your realm to the best of his ability against people trying to kill you, poison you, murder you, steal your children, anything that's hostile, he is protecting you from. Now, if he's supporting your schemes, that would be like if I decided you needed to die, I would click murder, and it tells you the chance, as well as the chance to be secret, and how long that would take. If I switch him, all of these would go up based on his, you know, intrigue skill. You need to be careful with that, though, because the second you do that, that could leave you vulnerable to be killed. So, you need to make damn sure that you kill whoever you need to kill if it's that important and switch them back. Because if you don't, 
you could literally screw up your realm very badly. And even if he's on Disrupt, you can still get killed. It's just harder for them. And the last part, which can sometimes be useful, is find secrets. You can pick any section of the map that's in green. And basically, they will look for secrets in courts or things like that. Hmm. I want to know is why. Okay. Seven months, 14 months. Hmm. Not really sure why it's showing in green. I figured that was the range, but it looks like you can. <clears throat> Maybe those are the courts. Who knows? I would assume that that's basically probably where you want to stick. I would assume the farther are you are away, the less likely you're going to find secrets. But, okay. So, going from our council to our court. If you look here, these are basically everyone in your kingdom or people that you can recruit. Now, normally you want a court physician, especially, you know... In case you get injured or wounded, you don't want to have to be searching for a court physician while you're wounded. That is a terrible, terrible time to be looking for a court physician. So you could go down to decisions and look for a court physician, just like you can look for knights. But I tend to like this method a little better. Go down to our couriers. Now, if you remember, it said that our half-brothers... You know, we're not married yet. So. This is the one that has okay learning skill. No, oh, His fertility is low. Well, we're going to click find a spouse. But we're going to click and have high learning skill. Now, why does it matter what someone's learning skill is, you might ask? Because normally that means that they're going to be a physician of some type. Or at least decent and competent enough to do that. So, we're going to marry our brother to Helena. And as soon as she's married to him, we can appoint as our court physician and only spend 10 gold. Now, oh, we got our call to war. From Duke William, the Bastard of Normandy. Well, we're going to accept that, but we're not really going to do anything just yet. Because we're also still not really unpausing. So, if... We were, you know, wanting to get some better knights for our realm, which I always want to do. You can go under your court and find every person who lives with you in your realm. And you can marry them off. Now, the other side effect, or the other side effect the other types of people you want to recruit are court physicians you know you want knights or you could possibly recruit for people for your council your chancellor your steward and your marshal have to be male unless they are a female title owner your spy master can be female why that's a difference lord only knows but that's how this is set up, at least in this run. Now, different cultures might have different rules. It could also, I believe, be based on your religion. Uh, da, da, da. Yeah, because there's a lot of different stuff that's, you know, allowed, not allowed. But I don't want to go too much into all that. So, but, you know, if we have any female couriers, we are going to marry them, which I don't think. Oh, here we go. All right, so she actually has even a really good martial skill. So, you know, I don't want to marry her because we could because that would give us our second wife. But, you know, <clears throat> all right, hold on. I click the right button. I do this all the time. OK, find spouse. I always do that. Okay, this guy has decent... Oh, his prowess is terrible. Okay, maybe not him. <clears throat> yeah, we 
can do prowess. Yeah, see, his prowess is better. Because that's what we want. We want people with good prowess. So now, he's our knight. Because he has good prowess. So. We scroll down. She's married now. Our bishop. Maybe we can find a wife for him, but, you know. Guess we keep some out of our hair. Hmm. Which is decent. But yeah, there's no real reason. You know, I like to save that for when we need a court physician or something like that. We don't have a lot of females in our court, you know, that we need. Now, that's not to say that we shouldn't marry off our knights. You know, for some certain traits. Because this is our house. You know, he is from our house. She has this trait, which would give us some really good possible traits to give to our, you know, non-title owning family members. So, you know, that's something to do. Now, he is our nephew. So he's our half-brother's son. So we want to see if we can try to find him a house. Or, pff, look, good lord, find him a house. Find him a wife. Words are hard. So, you know, you can look. Lion's power is really not a thing. So you can actually search by, you know, a trait. Hercules, yes, please. So we will accept that. Okay. So Hercules is no more, but we could look for another giant, which doesn't exist. So another thing you can do is inheritable traits on and you'll see that she is robust which is not as good but decent because the thing is the sooner you start marrying off your knights and allowing them to have kids the sooner you will have people to take up the next generation so you know like this lady she's gonna make a lot of kids this is our nephew so, I mean, if that medium chance, I'm sorry, what? Okay. Okay, so we're not going to marry off anymore. Like, you could spend hours doing that. But basically, you know, we went over our court. The only other thing to show you would be, you know, prisoners, which if you have prisoners, you have the option of execution, you know, negotiating release or torturing them. There's a lot of different stuff you can do with that, which we'll go over once we actually get one. I'm going to try to, you know clip this pretty quickly but <clears throat> basically we'll go over schemes as we do them which I'm sure we will very quickly you know basically I kind of already went over it a little bit these are hooks and secrets you know these are schemes that you have going you can have a personal scheme as well as a hostile scheme hostile scheme you know something that you normally don't want people to know about personal schemes don't really matter as much this is where factions would happen if we had a faction and then vassals who cannot join factions normally have an alliance with you or if you have a strong hook on them that's why it's normally crucial to either remove your vassals from power if you need to or to marry them off to members distant members of your family and the last thing is the decision tree if you look here these are the decisions that are available to you i'm not going to go over all these because they take forever but this is the search for position button, which you saw. Call for hunt, which basically is a way to get you prestige if you have the money for it, which we do not. A feast is basically a way to make your vassals like you more. You also have options to learning secrets and other side things. Pilgrimages are also good if you're trying to get piety. 
It's a good way to get titles and things like that. They normally cost a fortune, so not something we're going to be doing at the very beginning. So, I know it was a little rushed towards the end. I didn't want to go episode 3 without actually playing, so forgive me if I talk very fast. But I do appreciate you stopping in and watching the video. Thank you so much, and we will finally be unpausing on episode 3. Thank you again. This was fabulous, and I'll see you next time.